we're very happy to have all of you with us today. Um, we're going to get started. Again, if you're just joining us, if you please type your name and your affiliation in the chat so that way we know uh, who's with us today, we'd appreciate that. And so like we were saying earlier, uh, today's focus for this gathering is going to be about Louisiana French. And we're very fortunate to have with us Mr. David Sheremy, um, who used to be the, the form, well, was the former director of Codafil, former CEO of the Bayou Vermilion District, and owner of Bayou Zen Media Services. Uh, he's here with us today um, to present Louisiana French in the 21st century, an old language in new media. So we're very excited to have him with us today. Here's the, the, the folks that bring this program to you, myself. Uh, Maida Owens, Dr. Rachel, uh, Do Rachel, I'm going to mispronounce your name. I'm just going to go with Dr. Rachel and Dr. Gary. How about that? Um, <laughs> so we're very, uh, we, it's a wonderful group of people that get together to be able to bring this program to you. Uh, it's nice working alongside those folks. So um, this slide is to let you all know that we are experiencing some very wicked problems here in coastal Louisiana and that we will need um, a lot of different strategies and solutions to be able to overcome those challenges. So uh, this is sort of our disclaimer that our group here does not support any particular strategy for adaptation. Um, we're just here to have those conversations together. Our partners are the Louisiana Folklore Society, the Center for Bayou Studies at Nichols, Louisiana Folk, Louisiana Folk Life Program, Center for Louisiana Studies, and then the Wetlands Discovery Center. Um, we are very excited to add a new logo to, to this slide. Um, we have uh, the support from Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities now, along with our friends at BETNEP, the National Endowment for the Arts, and of course, Louisiana Office of Cultural Development. If you guys know any other logos that would like to join uh, this slide, uh, please let us know. Um, we're always uh, looking for new avenues um, of funding sources. So um, I'd also like to now talk about the Passing It On workshops, which is a program that Ms. Maida Owens does over uh, through, well, through the Louisiana Folk Life Program. So Maida, would you like to talk a bit about that? Certainly. Um, yes, uh, we've been doing Passing It On workshops since uh, February 2019. If you change the next slide. This was our very first one. Uh, when we first start get uh, started the Bayou Culture Collaborative, I happened to be in a position to take action. And so I redirected any National Endowment for the Arts funds and we started funding these. And Lance Brown uh, did costume making, taught uh, costume making for the crew of tradition in Homa. He was our very first workshop. and. Uh, we, we're, we are going to be getting more. Uh, we're not ready to announce it yet, but if you stay in contact with us, uh, we will be announcing that soon. Thank you very much for that. Um, and so this is uh, today's agenda. We're going to have Mr. David uh, Shermy present shortly. Um, we will have a question and answer uh, period right after his presentation. We're going to talk about his hope for the coast. Uh, and then we'll share some information about the position statements, offer uh, our working groups an opportunity to share some of the, uh, the, the things that have been going on with them. We open it up to announcements of anyone from the group. And then if you'd like to stick around for the informal discussion, that will last until 1.30. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce all of you to Mr. David Charmy, if you uh, aren't a good friend of his already. I'm sure many of you in the group uh, do know David. We're very thankful to have you with us today and uh, very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for being with us, David. Bien, merci. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me here, especially Rachel uh, Dougherty. <laughs> she pronounces her name. Uh, Thank you for that. Thank you for that. A good, uh, <laughs> a good friend and colleague of, of mine also. Uh, working at the Louisiana Center for the uh, Center for Louisiana Studies, rather, uh, doing a great job over there. Um, but our topic today is talking about Louisiana French in the 21st century and old language in new media. Um, uh, 
uh, talk about Louisiana French. Why why am I using the term Louisiana French and not Cajun French? Well, there's there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, and also we say quoi c'est ça? You know, what's that quoi c'est ça? But in, in re reference to my Lafouche Parish origins, we would say qui c'est ça? Or what's that? So right there from the beginning, <laughs> we see a little bit of difference. But these little uh, pronunciation or word differences, I, I think we don't need to get too uh, stuck up on stuck on them and, uh, and and trying to be more pan South Louisiana. There are a lot of different uh, words that could uh, be used west of the Chafalai that you can't east of the Chafalai, where the Chafalai seem to be pretty much the dividing line between the two halves of Acadiana, where the French uh, differs uh, appreciably. Uh, well, Louisiana French, of course, is a particular uh, way of speaking French. It's a variety we have here down in South Louisiana. Uh, it's an old language uh, because we came over with our uh, Acadian and our French uh, ancestors, you know, many years ago, and it kind of evolved in its own territory. A lot of the words we use uh, are proper to, to South Louisiana. For example, uh, one of the famous words is Shawi. A raccoon. I'm sure a lot of people even went to school with went to school with a guy y'all called Shawi, right? Uh, well, I did. Oh, uh, but Shawi is means raccoon, and the raccoon is a North American animal. So when the Europeans first got here, they had no idea what that animal was supposed to be. So they asked the uh, indigenous peoples, the Choctaws, for example. So what do y'all call that animal? So oh, that's saying Shawi. You know, that's that was the native word for it. But the French, being the French, had to invent their own word for it. They came up with raton laveur which literally translates as a big rat that washes its food, which is, you know, not very poetic. It's very, very, you know, to the point, descriptive, and I much prefer shall we anyway. But I just want to say right off the bat, we wouldn't be here right now if it weren't for this organization called Codafil, and I'm prejudiced. I, would, I was, uh, you know, director of there for 13 years, but I learned French because of, of Codafil, who went for, and a lot of people in my generation were not uh, taught French by their parents. Uh, even their parents, that was their first language, and our grandparents I had one grandmother who spoke uh, no English whatsoever, uh, and she lived with us, and I never, was never able to speak to that woman. Uh, and it wasn't until I got back from France in the early 80s that I learned to speak French fluently, and I met my the last remaining grandparent, my father's mother, and previous to that, I always thought that she was kind of kind of dumb. She spoke very, you know, broken English, longly baroque, as they say. But when I started speaking to her in French, I discovered a whole new person. She was funny. She was intelligent. She was, she was great to be around. You know, she, I mean, I just never knew that woman. I could just think of what I, what I could have learned from my other grandparents if I was able to speak to them in French uh, before that. So, so thanks to Codafil. But Codafil, of course, you know, had the, at the very early days had that priority. They had to impose the standard, the Parisian French, however you want to call it. And you know, there are a lot of hiccups, a lot of problems with that. But eventually. What it uh, became, uh, you know, uh, many years later, we, the uh, Dictionary of Louisiana French has spoken of the Cajun Creole and, and American Indian uh, uh, communities. And here in the bottom, you see some of the names of these people, uh, all of these people. I'm very proud to say they're, they're good friends of mine now, Barry Jean Soleil, Richard Guidry, who had passed on by the time this came out, who was one of my great mentors. Uh, Tom Klingler, Amanda LaFleur, Tamara Linder, uh, Thomas Picione, and Dominique Ryan under the director uh, of Albert Waldman and, and Kevin Urutet. Uh, yeah, and they take the point that the French, all the French that we speak here in South Louisiana is, is good French, as it should be, you know, and it's here in the dictionary. If you don't have this dictionary, you, run, uh, you go and order it right after this, this meeting because it should be in every household in South Louisiana. Um, to understand what the, the 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 depth and diversity of Louisiana French are always just as good as anything that um, can be spoken in, in in Paris or Brussels or Dakar, Montreal, anywhere else in the French speaking world. And speaking of the French speaking world, uh, Codafil, one of the projects I worked on, I uh, didn't get too much success in that. Well, I, I did make a little bit of progress, but it wasn't until a few years ago that Louisiana was finally admitted into a group called uh, L'Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie which is kind of like the UN, I guess you could say for French speaking countries. Uh, and it's kind of a misnomer too, because a lot of countries that are, are full members like Bulgaria and Mexico, which are not necessarily French speaking countries, but they are um, independent nations, okay? And we're the only uh, uh, political entity 
that is a member. We're not a full member. We're not a full, we're an observer in it, but we are in it and we're not a sovereign nation. Um, and we're the only one that is like that because of our long history in French. So that opens the doors to a lot of other possibilities. We are a member of the International Agency of Francophone Universities, the Parliament, the French uh, uh, parliamentarians. They just had a big meeting here in uh, in um, in uh, Baton Rouge. Not too long ago, a lot of uh, French-speaking parliamentarians from from North America were here um, doing a meeting in French. So, so we, that has really opened the door, opened that space for us, and that's really going to be the focus of my talk here about the spaces where Louisiana French is spoken. Um, and well, what's the difference between a dialect and a um, and a language, uh, people actually call them Cajun French or Louisiana French a dialect or this and that. Well, Amanda has a very good, uh, and Amanda was one of the uh, work, worked on the dictionary, has a great book also that you should have, Tonnerre Mes Chiens, with a lot of good Cajun expressions in it. Uh, and she says, well, a language is a dialect that has an army and a navy. So that we see the, the political uh, powers that be determining what's good French and what's not good French, right? Um, I just came across a very good uh, website. I mean, I'm going to share it in the chat later on. Um, talk about the different dialects in France, because even in France, French was not a unified language. And when our ancestors left France, you know, beginning uh, the Acadians, at least in the 1630s up to the 1713, uh, we all came from a particular part of Western France uh, called around Poitiers and a little bit further south. And if you click on some of those links, you'll hear some of the old talking. I, I swear they sound just like some Occasions or people or Acadians from uh, Nova Scotia uh, and a lot of the expressions. And, and I think mon cousin, Mike Gis Gisclard, is on the call. And he, you'll hear the, the he also. The woman says oblige or oblige, um, that aspirate H, which people try to say comes from Spanish, but it doesn't. It's a very old French um, um, pronunciation of that, of that letter. Um, and uh, and even today we talk about how we're all related, you know, kind of half jokingly. But but guess what? We were related before we even left France because they all came from the same area and a lot of these same families, and they all intermarried, intermarried when they got here. So that was our particular way of, of forming this language over many years. Another space where this language of, was spoken for many many years, you know, uh, the original social network. Uh, I have a few pictures up here that uh, some of y'all from, uh, from Lafourche Parish might recognize this first one on the, on the upper left here. Um, and if you're from Southwest Louisiana, I'm sorry, but this is the, ba the, the Bois de Cawain, okay? Cawain, east of the Chafalai is not a dirty word, okay? Even though they have uh, forbidden it from a, a walking crew, Mardi Gras crew in here in Lafayette called uh, the Crew de Cawain. Yeah, actually, there's a black banner over the name. They can only walk with the black banner because you're here in uh, in the Lafayette area. It needs something else. But, you know, it's just a, a, a snapping turtle or even like a, a pith helmet. Also, we call that a Cowan also. And there's one gentleman, Cowan Giscler, who's probably related to Mike. You'll probably tell me that later. Um, and all their buddies. Uh, and they would just sit out there and on those on the swings and the porches on the, and, and just talk. And you can see in the background some political signs. Uh, I always call this the New Hampshire of uh, Lufouche Parish politics, because if you didn't get past these guys, your political career was going nowhere, right? So if you couldn't get them to put your sign up on that on that tree, you could just forget about it, right? Uh, and this picture was taken by our good friend, um, Philip Gould, who gave me his permission to use it um, in that. And then here you see a couple other areas of you know, the dance hall. This was called uh, La Cage à Chien, the dog, the dog cage, um, where people used to meet, go to the dances flirt you know make uh, you know make new acquaintances as it were which eventually turned into these huge families right we uh my father came from a family of seven which was a pretty small family and most of us Sheremis, as you can see Sheremis king tux uh, king tux saloon we all descend from uh well from one Sheremi who came in seven um 1785 but um uh, it was most of us came from one of his descendants a man named zenon Sherami, who we had i think like 13 or 14 kids, mostly met, uh, boys. And those boys had a bunch of boys. So a couple of generations later, so I have so many Sheremis uh, down the Bayou. And this was one of the places, this was in Raceland, actually, this particular place. So these were the social networks where people spoke French um, in the homes, out in public, you know, even growing up in the 60s and 70s in Golden Meadow, I'd go to, the, I'd go to church, I'd go to the store, go anywhere, even though I didn't speak French, I heard it every day. You know, I heard French spoken every day. It was in uh, out in public. So now we go from the kitchen table going into the 21st century because, like I said, I grew up 
you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s. And nobody, my generation, very few of us spoke any French, which is kind of amazing, though, because now that I do speak French, I go back home and I find out that some of these guys I grew up with did speak French the whole time, uh, which, you know, kind of gives me a lot of hope. Uh, for that, but now it's mainly around French tables, les tables françaises, uh, and there, there are a bunch of them all across South Louisiana, and these are some of the ones uh, that I'm familiar with. The Club Dej uh, Lunch Club, which I'm missing right now here in Lafayette, uh, uh, and I participate uh, on a regular basis, and the Maison Valsain Broussard in, in Broussardville, it's every second Friday, and I participate in that one. Dwyer's Breakfast is probably the oldest one in, in Lafayette. It's on Wednesday mornings at 7. That's a little too early for me. Um, but then the uh, Table Francaise des Rat in Erath City um, Hall is every Friday at 11 uh, a.m. Et le Cercle Francophone in Thibodeau, uh, I believe it's at the old American Legion Hall on Tuesday at 5.30. Uh, oh, no, it's at the uh, Wetland Center. Excuse me. It's at the Wetland Center every Tuesday, so. And then, of course, now this areas are, are the physical areas are starting to shrink, but now we have the internet and it's starting to expand. So we do have the Louisiana French virtual table française, or française written here, it should be an S on an E on there to make it française because table is feminine, right? And we have a quote from Jordan Thibodeau, who's becoming a pretty uh, well known uh, internet uh, um, influencer, as they say nowadays, right? a uh, young man from, from this area, and he came up with this slogan, tu vis ta culture, tu tues ta culture, il n'y a pas de milieu, you live your culture, you kill your cu culture, there's no middle ground. So now that the language is starting to spread out, um, you know, into the internet, and we get a lot of feedback uh, from pe local people, and getting interest from local people, but now we're connecting back with the international French community, um, which for better or worse, sometimes try to correct our French, but that's another that's another question. And but I really enjoy um, that people asking, you know, question, how do I say this? How, what kind of French name can I give my business, my dog, you know, my kids, you know, some old kid, you know, give the, and I see the old French first names coming back because my generation and just before, even though the parents spoke French, they started giving English first names to their kids. And now you're starting to see, see names like, uh, like Clélie and, and uh, Vincent and Martin, that's my kids' names, not Clélie, but um, coming back, yeah. Even though those kids don't necessarily speak French, we start, like Jean-Paul is starting to be very popular also. Uh, well, and some of the, the girls' names are always popular uh, in French for whatever reason, but now you see some of the guys' first names coming back. Uh, the radio waves, of course, was always a very big uh, space where uh, French remained alive for many years. I, I grew up listening to KLEB uh, down in uh, in Golden Meadow with Dudley Bernard. Um, and I understand they still have a bunch of those recordings that I'm going to have to find a way to get our hands on because Mr. Dudley and others uh, did some great job. And now we have some young people like Colby Lejeune, uh, who has a, a radio program on KRVS, KRVS here in Lafayette, uh, Radio Acadie, still does um, a lot of programming in French. Also, you can And now you can go on the internet, download their app, as it were, and listen to some of these programming. But Colby is an, an amazing young man. Um, he has a degree from Tulane, and he's working on his master's in, uh, here at, at UL. But him and a couple other guys, um, as soon as I uh, heard them talking, uh, like uh, Zachary Fusilier, Zach Fusilier, who's a, a fiddle player, and he works at Vermilionville also, and uh, even Cedric Watson, the, the Creole fiddle player. You know, I, first time I heard these guys talk French, I said, I, I thought I was talking like 80-year-old sharecroppers, you know, or, you know, 75-year-old fishermen. You know, I said, they, they, sound, they sound exactly like the guys, you know, I remember when I was a little boy who might have been to the Bois de Calais, you know, and, and talking their French like that. So I think it's really great that they're, they're coming back, not only with the French, but speaking French, but, you know, the old way of speaking it also. And if you have a chance to hear Colby um, either directly uh, you know, uh, live or go on the app, I, I highly recommend it because I um, can't, can't repeat it enough. So, but the radio waves, like I said, has always been a space where, French was uh, was was alive in, in South Louisiana with other uh, like KVPI, KBON stations like that. But the internet also has come around, and this is an, um, a great example of the early internet days. I mean, I'm talking about the 2000s, early 2000s, where this young man Jean Le Chausson, uh, aka Rocky McCune, that uh, Jonathan told me he taught in middle school actually. Uh, and Rocky is just an amazing man. Uh, 
he uh, he had a little company called Television La Fouche Tarbonne, and he sang in a band called Idanier, um Last Last Island, which of course was an uh, uh, an island that was destroyed by one of the hurricanes um, back in the late nineteenth century. Um, but he did this show called the the Chauson Show, and that's <laughs> that's not easy to say. Le Chauson Show. And chausson in Louisiana French is a sock, okay? So he puts his hand in his sock, puts some googly eyes on it, and just starts talking to people. So here he's talking to, you probably recognize uh, Barry Jean Ancelet and Zachary Richard. And I'll just play a few few seconds of this to give you an idea of... Bonjour tout le monde, c'est le chausson show. On est ici, dans la vision, et je connais, et qui vit? On est à Québec, on n'est pas en Louisiane, t'es perdu. On est à Québec. Et on est appelé parler avec Barry Osley et Zachary Richard. OK. Woo-hoo! OK. Uh, so you see that, and they're playing along also, Zach and, and Barry, because they, they switch out their identities. Barry, you know, Zach raises his hand when he says Barry and, and vice versa. But, you know, uh, Jean uh, Le Chausson saying, you know, uh, so here we are in Louisiana. So what, what town are we in? And then Zach says, oh, you're lost. We're in Quebec. <laughs> Not Louisiana, so it doesn't matter, you know, we go do it that way. So, and they play along, it's all fun. And he has a bunch of these like that, but these all dates like 15, 16 years ago. You know, this is well before, you know, Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff. He was just doing this on, on YouTube by himself. So, hopefully, Rocky is going to uh, make a comeback uh, pretty soon because he's a very talented young man. And uh, and I just like everything he does. And oops, I'll go back. Oh, uh, more up to date kind of things. Also, we have a lot of uh, younger people, young people forming these little associations. Well, I shouldn't say little. I don't want to be demeaning to it anyway, but they're these associations uh, where the uh, foundation, these two young men, Scott Tilton and Rudy Bazinet. Uh, Scott is from New Orleans um, and Rudy is from Paris. Um, Scott met Rudy when he was um, studying in Paris. And while R- Scott was in Paris, uh, he started hearing about this Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie that I was talking about earlier. And he was thinking, like a lot of us think, that why isn't Louisiana at least somehow better affiliated affiliated with that? Because when I was director of Codafil, I went to three uh, different summits. They have big summits every other year where all, you know, I've met, um, you know, uh, Jean Chrétien and uh, Stephen Harper and uh, and uh, Albert de Monaco. I should have met, you know, not to brag, but I actually did meet these guys, you know, shook their hands. You know, so we, and little old me from Baye Lafouche you know, uh, shaking hands with, with the prince, you know. Uh, but we were not an official member. We just kind of invited, kind of like an afterthought. Uh, we had no official capacity. But Scott was able to get them to start the application process, which other people afterwards here in Louisiana were able to. I, I worked a little bit on that that dossier, but not, not as much as a lot of other people. And Louisiana did finally in 2018 become part of La Francophonie. Um, which opened a lot of doors uh, for a lot of more opportunities for French French to be uh, to be used internationally. Uh, one of the things they did, one of the uh, the new foundation did, is they they co-produced a short film. Now, if you're not familiar with the Create Louisiana uh, um, grants, uh, they they finance a lot of really and uh, this movie, for example, uh, Film Quest. If you don't know Sam Craft, a uh, singer in a, a group called Sweet Crude, also, and then uh, our, our uh, Bruce Degrepont uh, National, as we call him, you know, he's a national treasure. Bruce is. He writes all his own songs. Also, he doesn't. He's not a, a Cajun cover band. Um, not to say that's anything wrong with that, but like most Cajun bands are pretty much cover bands, uh, singing the traditional songs, which is fine. But Bruce plays no, practically no traditional songs. He writes all his own songs. Uh, and he's from Marksville area. And so they can have uh, you know, up to $100,000 uh, worth of prizes to make your own little film. If you have a chance to, to look at it, I think it's on, on YouTube. It's hilarious and it's in, all in French. And I think it's just uh, the great thing. Like I said, New Foundation uh, is part of it. And you're going to see how a lot of all of these groups and people, they all, we all kind of intersect and run into each other. Um, and saying about the, this is more about Create Louisiana. It's... Uh, it's a French culture film grant, um, and it's supported by TV Saint Monde USA. TV Saint Monde is the French um, uh, television uh, channel that, if you have cable, you can get. Uh, I used to watch it all, but I, I cut the cable, so I don't get TV Saint Monde anymore. 
but it's still available if you have the cable here in, in, in the Lafayette area. But also Cox Communications, Deep South Studios, Louisiana Entertainment, and Coda Phil are all part of uh, that grant, which produces some very amazing uh, films. It's in a, I know a lot of people don't know about these films, but they're out there. Um, like Le Grand Remix was the first one in 2017. Uh, you know, it's a story of two Francophone New Orleans denizens, you know, who with heartbreak music and the share love the vintage French vehicles, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's, it's, it's you know, I say it like that, but it's it's a pretty good movie. It's it's, it's a little different the way it's edited, uh, I have to say, but it's very innovative and it's all in French. Same thing with On Va Continuer, uh, with the Lost Bayou Rambler, Ramblers, you know, uh, Louis Michaud and his band and his bands are doing some very innovative things. They're pushing the boundaries of Cajun music and they're doing everything in French. Intentions in 2019, uh, about uh, 11 Cajun Creole and Chittimacho women talking about, you know, traiteurs and preserving their old ways and whatnot. A very, very well-made movie. In 2020, 17 year Locust, great movie also. I mean, I, it had me crying at the end, uh, honestly. And the woman uh, is a good friend of mine who plays the woman in, in the movie is uh, Becca Begno, that's some, some of y'all probably know. Um, who was a her, her herself, and she was in the uh, movie Intentions also, and she's just a great, great actress um, in that in that movie. And the last, uh, well, 2022, I haven't had a chance to see Tombu, uh, an elderly Black Creole grandfather must make money for street performing or move to Oklahoma with his uh, daughter and grandson. But Tombu is um, uh, Creole, Louisiana Creole for um, drums. So I haven't seen him, so I imagine drumming is a part of the story somewhere. And this year's movie, a winner is uh, a movie called Footwork, talking about uh, the Creole trail ride traditions. Also, uh, get twenty five thousand dollars. You know, if you got a good, that's that's not a small chunk of change, right? If you're an independent filmmaker, right? So you have Rachel uh, Netterveld as a producer, but the director is this young man Drake LeBlanc, who is a product of French immersion. As a matter of fact, my wife actually taught him one year. Um, but Drake and his partner Bill McGrew are more famous, I guess you could say, for starting this um, media group called Tele Louisiane, who has a lot of great projects going on. Uh, but I'll just talk about two of the, the main ones, talk about La Veillée. And uh, Jonathan was talking about trying to set up the the one of the, the for the Lugaru Fest that we're going to talk about a little bit more later, uh, with the, this, the, uh, the rockers on the porch and whatnot, La Galerie. And that, that's how the set is set up, but, but La Veillée. You know, it can make the veille, uh, was something that we used to do before television and movies and all that, before electricity, pretty much everybody with the coal oil lamps and whatnot. Just making the veille, just passing the night, just talking to each other, drinking coffee or whiskey or whatever. And then the uh, adventures of Boudini. Boudini was a, a, an actual um, character on television here in La the Lafayette area. He did a children's show uh, played by a gentleman by the name of Ken Mo. And this is kind of much of a caricature of, of Ken as the character of Boudini. Um, and it's and it's great. A lot of kids watch it. Um, it's it's funny. It's in in uh, educational and whatnot. So I'm give you all a couple of couple examples of that also. Ici à cette ensemble, using Cajun French, Louisiana French in the in the title. Full gumbo, mais j'ai pas de recette écrite. Proche, tout le monde va manger le gumbo avec du riz. Ah ouais, le riz. Timon? Timon? Timon! Okay, that's, that's, that's enough of that. <laughs> you know what is funny? But, but you might have heard um, Boudini is voiced by Kirby Jambon or Kirby Hombon from down the bayou. Uh, T-Boy is Louis Michaud, and you might have noticed the Hitachi rice cooker also. You're talking about authenticity. Who did not have a Hitachi rice cooker in their kitchen? You didn't grow up in South Louisiana. Um, and uh, and Cedric Watson was was the voicing the, the alligator also was part of the uh, thing. So it's all, it's very, very informative, very instructional. And it's also very environmentally conscious. They, they talk about, you know, pollution and, and land loss and all those things that also that La Veille here, uh, talks about here's you know uh, here's a, a down the bayou also uh, talking about after uh, after Ida. Bonsoir. On est ici dans la paroisse La Fouche où dans l'année passée l'ouragan Ida fait des dommages personnels et environnementaux. 
On vient ici pour parler aux résidents sur comment les tempêtes ont changé la vie et la terre pendant les décennies passées et comment la levée et d'autres projets de protection des côtes peuvent réduire les effets au futur. OK. So, that, that's just an example talking about hurricane protection and, and all the, uh, the damage that's been done by Ida. Also, they're standing in front of uh, what used to be the library. And I think they just tore that building down yesterday or day before. Uh, and it just kind of stayed like that for two years. This has been two years. Oh, it's been two years huh, since Ida. And so finally, they just they tore it down. Uh, and that's Drake, of course, as I was saying. Uh, and the young woman with him is uh, Caitlin Ogeron whose uh, father is Joe Ogeron, who's a representative down there, uh, down the Bayou, and who I knew as, as a little boy. Also, our families knew each other very well. I knew Caitlin's, her father, her grandfather, even her great-grandfather, uh, Juan, his name was, uh, it's not Juan, it was Juan, Juan Ogeron, who spoke, uh, you know, spoke French as his first language, and Mr. Bobby, too. And Mr. Bobby, the grandfather, was probably... Uh, the person I would probably say who spoke the most French whenever he was in public, you know, my, he played golf with my dad and whatnot. And I'd, I'd always hear that guy speaking French, you know. Um, so, uh, oh, there, oh, go back. Oh, um, now that the all of these uh, energies and synergies are coming together, all uh, this youth movements, right? Uh, and just this past weekend in uh, Saint Martinville. They started forming uh, a group called L'Assemblée de la Louisiane, who's going to try to uh, be more um, assertive, shall we say, to to um, for our linguistic rights, but also for preserving our culture. Because even though French is a big part of this uh, mix, and a lot of the people that you see in this picture, um, and some of them are cropped out because we just ran out of uh, of room, um, speak French, but a lot of them don't here. But a guy like here, you can see, uh, you might recognize Kyle Crosby. Another boy from down the Baya who does a uh, thing on the um, on YouTube and TikTok called Louisiana Dread, where he talks about Louisiana history, and he does a gumbo review also, which I love. I'm have to follow his footsteps and get some of that gumbo that he keeps talking about. But he doesn't speak French, you know. But he does a good good job of trying to uh, preserve it. And then you see guys like here, uh, Jordan Thibodeau, uh, recognizable of course from his unique haircut. And uh, who has a shirt on today, exceptionally. No, I'm just teasing. If you, if you haven't seen Jordan perform in public, uh, Jordan Thibodeau in a rodailleur, a rodailleur, a rodailleur somebody just kind of runs around the countryside. He uh, often, you know, he kind of goes Iggy Pop on you and he takes his shirt off. But uh, he's a great performer. Uh, he speaks French very well, plays the, 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 the fiddle very well. Uh, so, yeah, so they're forming this youth group and trying to... Uh, um, you know, try and get more people interested in creating these new spaces, both virtually and and uh, and in real life. Also, where French is important, also try to perform just like New Foundation. They're also pushing the economic importance of, of speaking French and, and our culture. And that's part of the mission of this group as well. So almost finished. But as I said, we had Codif if it wouldn't have been for Codif, we'd be speaking in French. And if it weren't for the French immersion schools, we wouldn't have, because a, a lot of these kids uh, that you saw in the picture, oh, they're not kids anymore, but uh, like Drake, they went through French immersion. I think a guy like Chris Stafford, who has uh, some bands, and I didn't even talk about the music also. That's, that's that would be a whole nother presentation about the importance of French in the music scene. I kind of mentioned it with Louis Michel, but that would be a whole nother presentation. But uh, yeah, the French immersion schools, there are about 22 of them in uh, 10 different parishes. Uh, just put some of these more interesting ones here, Myrtle Place Elementary School here in Lafayette, is a 100% French immersion school. It's also a blue ribbon school. The teacher, the um, principal, Catherine uh, Brisselge uh, from Belgium uh, is the, uh, she actually was a teacher I recruited many years ago to come to Louisiana and she stayed. Um, well, me and the whole team, I don't, I don't take all the credit for bringing her here, but um, but yeah, she came when I was still director of Codafil. And then this year we have the Ecole Pointe aux Chiens the first uh, Franco-Indian uh, immersion school, just getting uh, cranked up uh, down there uh, in Terrebonne Parish. But interestingly enough, we also have two French immersion programs in North Louisiana. Fairfield Elementary Magnet School in Shreveport is one of them, and the Ruston Elementary in uh, in Ruston in Lincoln Parish. And believe it or not, Ruston, uh, Lincoln Parish has always had a very strong French program. Even before I became director of Code of Phil, uh, Richard Guidry, Oh, I mentioned earlier, always telling you, Lincoln Parish, from the very beginning days of Codafield, Lincoln Parish has had a French, a very strong French as a second language 
program. So for whatever reason, I don't know, they just love French up there in Lincoln Parish. And, uh, you know, God bless them for it, you know. So the challenges, though, we're facing, though, that we can more and more schools and more and more classes being added. But what's the challenge? Well, where are we going to find all the teachers that we need? And that's always been the challenge. I mean, we can uh, uh, do like Blanche Dubois and say, you know, we can always depend on the kindness of strangers, right? And we have been depending on the kindness of France for many, many years. Uh, we've been depending on uh, a lot of Canadians from Quebec and Acadie, but they're much smaller pool, I guess you could say, of possible teachers in, in France is a lot from Belgium. Belgium has always been a very strong, despite being a very small country, we've always had a lot of um, good Belgian teachers to the point where one day my wife and I were uh, uh, shopping at, I think it was at the Walmart, like we say down the bay, um, and we were looking at something we wanted to buy, I don't remember what it was, and we just kind of looked at the price tag, and our son, our middle son, Martin, was with us, and he said, uh, and he looks at the price, he says, 25 dollars et 95 sous. Now, if you, if you understand French, you understand that there were three different Frenches in that one system since. 25, well, that's kind of universal at like 25, right? Dollar, that's that's standard French. We would say piastres, right, in, in Louisiana. But 95, that's 95 in Belgian French. We would say 95, as most of the French people would. But he said 95 because that year he just happened to have a Belgian teacher in French immersion. And sous, of course, is Louisiana French for since also. So, so and you know, and we talk about the future of Louisiana French. Um, I think we cannot neglect the importance and the influence and the um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The influence of international French of having all these international French teachers here. But we still depend very greatly on them. And actually, a couple of years ago, when the previous uh, administration was in um, in Washington, they you know they had a very anti immigrant well, let's put it anti, very strong uh, uh, immigration policy. They were trying to keep people out uh, for various reasons, but we almost did lose our our visas for these teachers coming in from France and elsewhere. And it was really wasn't the last minute um, that we were able to get the visas for the teachers to come to Louisiana for that one school year. And unfortunately, we've yeah, been able to continue having these teachers, but you know, we still, we still, uh, and we thank France for it, and we still depend a lot on France, and France has still been a very good partner because they have been uh, supplying the lion's shares of our French teachers for our, for fi over 50 years. So, but we're getting more Louisiana teachers coming, so that's always a good thing. So, so, est-ce que vous êtes, vous êtes à des questions? Uh, vous êtes à des questions pour moi? We have uh, we have time for one question. Oh um, man, I talk too much. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. We're, um, but no, that's that's fine. Uh, Gary, did you have a question? Yes. Sure. Uh, thanks, David. I want to appreciate the service that you uh, did with Codafil. You know, <laughs> I think it runs parallel to some of the um, questions that people have about why save the coast. You know, because we often have to, from the biology point of view, you have to argue the fact, well, why why save it? And I know Codophil has also had to sort of argue about that. What, you know, why do we have to more or less res preserve French? And <clears throat> you probably have the better answer. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that Codophil has been there. And it's like uh, at least... Mm -hmm. Y'all stopped the bleeding. It was. Yeah. It, it seemed like it was on its last breath in the seventies, and mm -hmm. and y'all saved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my question gonna, is like, yeah. what what do you say when people say, "Well, uh, you know, is it worth it to try to save something that it, it's almost?" I think they're going to say you can't get it back. Mm -hmm. But but what what do you say to that? Well, you can't get it back the way it was because, but but I tell people, well, you know, my the the French that my parents spoke was not was not the French that their grandparents spoke. You know, and we've had all these influences coming in, and now we do have this international French. So this is what connects us to the to the rest of the world, really, and that's what keeps us uh, as our um, as the core. Even though a lot of people who don't speak French, a lot of people who are not going to learn to speak French, but they're still going to participate wholly in 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 our in our culture. But once again, I'm going to quote Richard Guidry and said, if, you know, once the language goes, the culture goes. So the culture has to reside somewhere. Um, you know, even though in France, just for example, you know, we talked a little bit about you know, these regional languages. Those regional languages are kind of like in the same situation Louisiana French is. But there are still people who speak Occitan. There are still people who speak Basque. There are still people who speak Breton. 
So Brittany and it re- maintains its unique cultural uh, identity within the French nation because people still do that. Same thing with the other languages. So, so that's important, you know. If and if you want to be, you know, we just had a, a a big campaign. You know, Louisiana is not like Mississippi. Well, guess what? If we get rid of French, we're going to be just like Mississippi. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, if you have other questions, we encourage you to stick around till the uh, for the informal part of uh, of this. And so you'll be able to chat with David after that. But um, one of the things that we always do in each of these sessions is ask our presenters, um, what is your hope for the coast? And so we'd like to present that question to you, David. What is your hope for the coast? Okay, but quel espoir et quel avenir moi je vais avoir? You know, what what hope and what future uh, am I going to have? And so I think, well, first of all, we have to have hope, you know, because it, it, if not, you know, we're not, we're not in the business being here, right? Doing what we're doing, trying to look to the future. Um, but, you know, we have this this culture and our, our people have been on their knees and been beaten down many, many times before, but we always managed to get back up and, and, uh, and keep on going. Um, Barry Ancelet always tells a story about you know, everybody always wants to close the coffin on, on Louisiana French, on Cajun, but every time they try to close the coffin, the, the body pops back up and asks for another beer. So that's <laughs> what my hope is that this will be another beer waiting for us somewhere uh, down the road, you know? Thank you so much for that. I really uh, appreciate your uh, your presentation and being with us here today. And so... Um, let me see about if I can take the share back. Um, and so again, please stick around uh, at, toward the end. We'll be able to talk a little bit more um, with David. So here is uh, some information on our position statement. If you would like to sign on to the statement, you have the QR code right there that you can scan or you can visit louisianafolklore.org to get more information. We've got 103 individuals and 25 organizations that have signed on. Um, If you're with an organization or if you as an individual would like to sign on, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, So I'll hand this back over to David or David, if there's um, someone else Mm -hmm. in your group that can talk a little bit about the summit that you guys are uh, putting together. Oh, but just just briefly, uh, you can see all the information. Well, we have a French language group that meets, but we're going to having a summit pour nos langages coming October seventh at West Baton Rouge uh, Museum. And we're going to talk a lot about these issues that I kind of brought up about advocacy for the for the language. You know, uh, trying to get more than just lip service from our political leaders because you know as we get a lot of that. Um, also, yeah, we we love you know we love Cajuns, we love French, we, you know, love the Creoles, but you know. They don't really do anything. Uh, we have to do pretty much ourselves to get a little bit more help. We don't need a whole lot of help. We just we need some. Uh, and we're talking about um, uh, the uh, see summit meeting at nine a.m. We just got nine a.m. See uh, Ivy, who's also very instrumental in in our group, also uh, talking about that conferring time yesterday. So, um, is there yeah, a the, and we're talking about we're talking about economic development uh, also. And the expansion of, of French, uh, not only in the immersion schools, but like I said, the problem with the immersion schools is that it, um, we don't have the teachers, but we have other ways to do it through through Zoom. I, I teach classes by, through Zoom and I have people from all over. And there's a very great, yeah. great interest of learning to speak French. Is there a fee to participate in the summit or you just have to no. read? No, no, just got to show up. Uh, so we have 108, uh, 108 individuals and a 25 we should have signed. Oh, they're talking about the... Um, I said, oh, I got 108 people coming to the summit already. <laughs> got me excited. Uh, so for more uh, information on that, uh, you can email David. Uh, I believe we may have some information on that for, on the louisianafolklore.org mm-hmm. website. Yeah. Um, but if not, you know, you can definitely get in touch with David there or any one of us. Um, is Theo with us in the group today to give us an update or anyone from uh, cultural and coastal planning? I'm not sure if Theo's in the group. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm here. Um, I, don't, I don't think Theo is around, but um, yeah, we're, we're definitely excited to um, kind of start again, start up with the group. Uh, they're actually maybe looking for a new convener, Theo, or just somebody that um, can um, take on a little bit of 
that role. If anyone's interested, um, you can still reach out to Theo right now, but just FYI for the future. And the group is having some open conversations about exactly what the goals are going to be. We've concentrated before on commenting on the coastal master plan um, and also really trying to dig into issues of cemeteries and preservation of cemetery um, in coastal regions. But we are open to, you know, whatever people bring to the group. So thank you so much for that, Simone. We appreciate the update. Um, next, if uh, I'm not sure if Tracy or Haley, if anyone is with us um, from the Preparing Receiving Communities group. All right. Um, if not, um, the next meeting. I'm here, is I'm here from the Receiving Communities. Um, we yeah. just met, uh, and uh, we had uh, Charles Sutcliffe, uh, the new state resilience officer presented to us and was telling us about some of the work that he's just beginning to do in coordinating different things, uh, different agencies and also uh, different activities across the state, kind of being a, connecting the dots and making sure things don't fall through the uh, cracks and uh, looking to have it be something set in stone to carry forward to the next administration um and that's also and he's looking at ways to involve us uh the bioculture collaborative and some of our working groups and some of the work he's going to be doing in the future so stay tuned for more on that but that was the main focus of of the meeting we just had uh yesterday but um it's a very good group looking at both receiving communities and the community to you know what people need to be able to stay where they are so we need more people to join. Excellent. Thank you so much for the update, Anor. And then uh, Artists and Tradition Bearers. Is Lauren with us or anyone from that group that might be able to give us an update? I'm here. Hey. Um, hi, thank you. Um, we met this week on, on Wednesday um, evening and we we're trying out a new day because previously we were meeting on the third Tuesday of every month. Um, we're going to try out Wednesday because a few people had um, suggested that with their schedules. It still is quite a small group, although the people who have continued to show up are dedicated. So I'm very thankful for that. And, you know, we just wanting to hold space for more people to join and, um, you know, wrap our heads around what our plan is. But in the meantime, you know, we are a think tank. We um, discuss different ways to um, get the word out and sort of just talking about maybe an awareness campaign about connecting artists who are doing um, work that is um, inspired by the environment, um, climate change, coastal artists that are working in that realm. And, um, you know, we talked about maybe like a hashtag or, or connecting to, um, to networks that already exist. So um, we also, you know, we just would love to get people together with expertise that are, um, you know, used to, that, that have experience putting together um just community projects. And uh, that seems to be an interest of a lot of the people who have, uh, you know, expressed that they want to be a part. Just hope it aligns with people's schedules and we can get um, some traction there. So if you know of any um, artists, if anyone out there know of any people who they have the thing would be great in this group. We're also, you know, going to be working on just sort of like an invitation of sorts, um, some wording to send to people who might not know about um, the BCC and, you know, expand our reach. Well, I'm thinking one of the things that we might be able to do, and because especially because we have Meta as a resource through the Louisiana Division of the Arts, is to maybe send out some information um, through the regional arts councils. Um, if maybe mm -hmm. getting a hold of those directors and trying to get them to pass the word to the artists within their communities. But we can talk offline about that later about how we can make that happen. I would I love to talk more. Yeah, we do. Sounds great. Thank you so much for all your work on that. Anytime. Um, 
HUD, are you here for uh, protecting collections or anybody from that working group that would like to give an update? I think PUD is here, but um, us with the Water Life Museum here in Homa, we're in the meeting. Um, it's a brand new working group. This was the inaugural meeting. Um, so it is just getting started. Um, the next meeting is on Wednesday, October 18th, but PUD is open to any time that works for um, any potential new members. So if you're interested, but that time doesn't really work for you, definitely shoot him an email. It's collectionsbcc at gmail.com. You can also email Maida um, and she can get that to him. Um, we're really just working on what are the goals of the group. Um, PUD would really like to let people know that this is not necessary necessarily just for people who work at museums or libraries or archivists. If you have, you know, family uh, treasures or things like that, that you are interested in protecting, especially with the coming hurricanes, that's been a big discussion with PUD has been, um, you know, a lot of people lost a lot of things during the hurricane. How can you protect those things um, going into the future? So this is open to anyone. You do not have to do this for your job. Um, if you are interested in all in preserving your culture and your collections, please um, go ahead and join us for this group. Thank you for that update, sir. And so that brings us to our uh, next presentation, which will be Friday, October 27th. Um, we have Dustin who's going to be with us. Uh, he's a, a social scientist with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, he will be presenting cultural heritage and liminal landscapes. So that's another word that I had to look up. I'm not even kidding. I was like, liminal, that's a, that's a, was a new one for me. So thank you, uh, Dustin, for helping me to expand my vocabulary. Um, but we're looking forward to having him um, Friday, October 27th. Uh, if any of anyone else in the group has any announcements, if you could, um, you can raise your hand, uh, Gary. Yes. Hey, I wanted to say something before we hit one, because I know you're uh, too humble to, to say something and y'all are South Louisiana Wetland Discovery Center yourselves. But I just wanted to make sure people knew that the Rougarou Fest is coming up in October. And um, Jonathan will, will, will say the exact date. But the whole um, impetus of the Rougarou Fest is to preserve our folkways and the folk cultures of Louisiana. So we're all sort of preaching this all the time, and that's a festival that's totally devoted to that. So if you're looking for an excuse to see that done um, in a palpable way, a tangible way, the Rougarou Fest is an awesome thing to see, and it's coming up soon. I'm going to let you say exactly when it is, Jonathan. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Gary. Uh, it's uh, October 20th, 21st, 22nd. Uh, so, you know, if you guys can make it out there, we'd love to have you. And thanks again, Gary, for mentioning that. Appreciate it. Uh, David. Yeah, I um, thank you. So this is d'abord je veux dire bonjour à Monsieur Charamy, que je connais très bien, il y a longtemps. Et nous avons les francophones en Louisiane centrale, mais il n'y en a pas beaucoup. So this has nothing to do with French. <clears throat> it's completely different. Um, Mr. Uh, Martin Nicola from the Czech Republic will be visiting Le Bus. Louisiana, which is just uh, outside of Pineville, on October 9th at 10 o'clock, uh, where he'll give a talk on uh, agrarian Czech colonies in the United States. And he picked Libus uh, as one of his colonies that he's studying. So he will give a short presentation on, you know, what he's found and comparing it to other places. And then the next day he's going up to the Ark archives at NSU that has an enormous collection of Czech language minutes and other documents from the Czech community in Labuse and Colleen. So uh, it's not coastal, it's not French, uh, but it is a, a very unique uh, folk tradition in Louisiana. The only, the only Czech colony in all of this, in the whole state. So um, just that's for your information. I'll put it in the chat just so you know where it'll be. It's at the Czech Hall in Labuse. Thank you for Thank that. You so much. Thank you, David. Maida? I just wanted to remind everybody that I post, I 
take every, all these announcements, all the information that's on all these slides, and I post them in the chat. So you can save your chat and get all of this. You don't need to be taking notes. Thank you very much for that. Any other announcements? All right. Um, I think we have another slide. So Maida, um, if you would like to talk a little bit about the climate migration and welcoming newcomers workshop that you'll be uh, doing soon. Yeah, th this is a special opportunity because part one is going to be via Zoom and for free. It's going to be next Thursday, uh, September 28th. And uh, I'm putting in the chat all the all everything that you see on this slide. Uh, the second part is going to be more about the welcoming uh, newcomers part, and but it is in in person at the summit, so you would have to pay the modest uh, registration fee. Thank you. Um, another thing that we have going on: uh, culture and climate conversations. It's a series of six community discussions that this group is um, putting together with uh, the help of Teresa Parker. The, the um, Rugaru Fest is actually one of those six. Um, and the others you can find if you visit the website, louisianafolklore.org, uh, to learn a little bit more about that. So we are very thankful that you're all with us today.